Hey friends, what is up? It is your good buddy Sam. Sometimes uh, at the beginning of these videos, I feel like I feel the need to tell a tell an anecdote or share a story or something. And every time I do, it always reminds me. Do you guys ever read Cooks Illustrated? At any point, I I used to read Cooks Illustrated when I was a younger and more cooksome man. And at the beginning, there was always a letter from the editor, or I don't know if it's the editor or the owner or someone in some kind of dominant position with respect to that magazine would write this little editorial about just about his life about how much his neighbors irritated him or how he thought that chipmunks were the worst creatures on earth or something it had nothing to do with cooking whatsoever and i always read it and wonder is this is this what it's really about is this seek whole magazine this whole complicated effort to figure out what the best cookware or how to make the perfect chicken pot pie or something is it all just an excuse for this man to write his little editorial complaining about you know suburban life or whatever. Anyway, I've gotten a bit distracted somehow. Um, what I want to talk about today is shaders again and continue this kind of shader thing. We've been, I'm going to go back to the physical modeling and the gen stuff soon. I promise to be honest, I just, uh, it's hard <laughs> and I'm trying to wrap my head around the math before I make a video about it. So in the meantime, I'm going to go a bit deeper into this, um, shader and try to get it, uh, club ready as it were. So I'm not quite going to get there today, but I'm going to get a lot closer. And I'm going to start just by taking this mesh here. And what I'd like to do is apply some post-processing effects to this mesh. And in order to do that, uh, let's just get this, remind ourselves what this thing looked like. And don't worry, this will be, a link to this old version will be in the description. So you don't have to feel like, you know, you have to start uh, from scratch and rebuild this as you see it. Here's what we've got. We've got this thing. You push a button. We make new noise. You can scale up or down the amount of distortion on this sphere, which has this nice stripey texture. And you can change the colors applied to the so-called inner and outer part of it, uh, depending on how far the things, you can see there's two colors here, depending how far the pixels are distorted from the center of the sphere. So what I want to do is first capture this to a texture. And the easiest way to do that is by doing something like this, jit.gl.node. And I'll give it a name at name CTX for context. And maybe that's a bad name because maybe you open up another patch and there the name is also CTX and you want to use something more unique. But for now, CTX is probably fine. And I'll also do at capture one. So this node captures to a texture. And then all I have to do with this JitGL mesh is do at draw to CTX. And the shape disappears over here, but now it's actually drawing out of this JitGL node. And if you bring in, uh, if you click on Visi and go to Output Viewer, you can actually view this texture. There our object is, it's safe and sound. Um, you should use a viewer if you're viewing a texture. If you're viewing one of these spearmint blue patch cords and not one of these wintergreen green patch cords, you should use a, a viewer and not a jit.p window because uh, the readback is much faster. You don't waste time going from the GPU to the CPU and you lose a lot of frames if you do it, if you do it that way. Anyway, so there's our image. It looks okay. Uh, if you want to actually see it again in this window, we can make a jit.gl.video plane at transform reset two. I set it transform reset two. And this will show us the image again there and where it belongs. And I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit here, set the position to 005 so we can see it centered, maybe even 0.5, 5.5, so it's a bit further away there. Um, so what I want to do now is, the, what I'm going to do this thing is apply a series of effects to it, uh, post-processing effects. And I'm calling this post-processing effects. I'm going to be applying shaders again. I'm going to be using uh, JIT gl.pix to create these shaders using them using the jit pix or jit gen shader language that's uh, in max looks like max unlike the I mean you remember the shader language we were using in the previous videos this uh, glsl it looks like code it's it looks nothing like max um, the reason we're using jit gl pix here number one these shaders are much simpler it doesn't involve as much kind of the complex math you know, it wasn't that complex but as much of the math as we were doing in the uh, GLSL. And also, we're not working with, verti with vertices, with vertexes anymore. I'm just working with this flat image. That's what capturing to this texture did. Before we were applying a kind of post-processing technique to this object, sorry, not post-processing, applying a shader to this object, and now I'm just applying a kind of effect or shader to this as an image. It's like we've taken a picture of this scene, and now we're doing something to that image. Anyway, so the three, first thing I want to do is make this JitGL Pix effect, not really an effect even, but just uh, a process here. So I'm going to give it at title alpha blend. 
and the idea here is that I'm going to use this uh, to express one way to blend between two different textures. So I'm going to take the texture on the left and take out the alpha channel of that texture. And when the alpha channel is 1, we're going to use the uh, input 1. And when the alpha channel is 0, we'll use input 2. So when the alpha channel is 1, we'll take the image on the left. And when the, out, the alpha channel is 0, we'll use the image on the right, which is a pretty standard way to think about and use alpha. So we use swizz A to swizz out the alpha, which is to say get the alpha channel out of the red, green, blue, alpha, the three channels all mixed together. You can also use swizz 3. And you can even use, I think, swizz uh, W because the coordinates go X, Y, Z, W. Uh, these are all synonymous, I'm pretty sure, but whatever, we'll use Swiss A so it's clear what we're doing. And then I'll throw in a mix here, and we'll just mix these like this. This will mix in the way that I described, where alpha gives you more. More alpha means more of the left channel or channel one. So here's our alpha blend. Um, it's there blending alphas, although it's blending with nothing in particular right now. What I want to do now is create a way, I'm going to be making a feedback loop similar to what we were doing if we were building a delay line in the audio domain. And one key part of the, of the delay line is, of course, you want to scale down the audio by some amount, by multiplying by, you know, 0 0.9 or something. Otherwise, audio never leaves the delay line and sound either just stays around forever, you've made a loop pedal or something, or it gets louder and louder and blows everything out. So I'm going to achieve the same thing here using a jit.gl.pix. This time I'll do at title fade, and all I'm going to do is take what comes in. This is the simplest shader that we're going to write. I'm just going to take what comes in. Uh, that wasn't what I expected to happen. I'm just going to take what comes in and multiply it by a value called fade, and then send it out. And fade here is just going to be a global parameter, param fade, with a default value of 1. And that's it. And that's the shader. So it's really an incredibly simple thing there. Uh, just fading out. We're just taking the red, green, blue, and even alpha values and maybe multiplying them by a number between 0 and 1 to scale down. So we take the fade like this, we attach this guy back up like so, and now if I take this and connect it like this instead so we can see the output of this effect, start moving things around. It's not quite as interesting as we want. We notice that this black background seems to always be overwriting everything. And that's because I didn't set, I forgot actually to set the, uh, before making this video, I thought the one thing to remember to do, remember to make sure that the erase color of JitGL node is transparent. And I didn't do it and I'm embarrassed and I can only apologize profusely and deeply and earnestly, but I'm going to make the best of a bad situation and now set the erase color to be 0, 0, 0, 0 which is to say transparent. And now if I hit this button, you'll see what I hope we would see, which is that the background uh, kind of sticks around forever, right? The shape never gets erased and it's always there even as you hit this button. And this effect like this where the image never clears between frames. It always reminds me, I don't know if you guys were around in the N64 days, but there was a game called might have been Shadows of the Empire or something. It was the first Star Wars game, I think, for that platform. There was a level in the beginning where you were flying around Hoth, the ice planet, and you had to trip the AT-ATs. The whole game kind of sucked, actually, but that part was really fun. And if you turned on invincibility somehow, you could fly out of the arena and into kind of the nether zone, do you know? And when you did, this effect happened. Your little ship wouldn't erase anymore and you could actually fly around and draw patterns in the sky with it. It's really cool. Um, I've kind of gotten distracted by my own tangent and also dated myself, probably. Um, but that's what always reminds me. I'm always reminded of that when I see this um, effect. But now if we take this fade and scale it down a bit, so if I call this fade and then do something like fade $1 so that this object knows that I'm using this number to talk about fade and start to bring this down a little bit, just a smidge. Now you can see it's kind of more like a delay line. There's some trails there. And this slider isn't really the best way to, maybe I want to do something like this, scale 0, 1, 0, 1, 3, or 0 0.5, maybe even 0 0.3 at classic 0. This will give me a little bit more room to maneuver here at the top end. Let's try this now. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Whatever, it'll do for now. 
So that's not too cool yet. All we have going on is a little fading. What I really want to do is kind of apply some effect at each stage so that the image kind of contorts and distorts as it fades. And I have a cool idea for how to do that that I'll show you in the next, in one of the next videos. For now, I'm just gonna do something simple and just zoom in. It's kind of cheesy and kind of a, it's an oldie, but a goodie as apparently one is wont to say. Oh, one other thing that I think I should mention here is that if the fade gets close to one and I hit this button, you may notice that it never totally fades you get this kind of gray color that doesn't go away. So like, watch, I hit this button and you can see this doesn't fade to black. It just kind of fades to gray as your fade gets very close to one. And that's actually because I forgot another thing about JitGL node, which is that JitGL node in this case defaults to representing colors as uh, chars, as 8-bit uh, characters, just integers between 0 and 255. And that's what's happening here. There's kind of a rounding error going on. And if you just come in here and do at type float 16, you'll find that everything actually fades to black as opposed to sticking around forever. So if you see that artifacting show up, that's what's probably happened. Your textures are being represented as low byte integers rather than as uh, floats. Where was I? I want to zoom in. So this is going to be the most complicated shader we write, and even it's not that very not even it is not that very complicated. We'll do a jit.gl.pix at title zoom. And what I want to do for this zoom shader, if you haven't seen this kind of shader before, the basic idea, imagine you were trying to zoom in on an image by taking one finger and kind of putting it in the center of the image, and then taking another finger and stretching it out. So you plonked one finger right down in the center, and then you take another finger somewhere else in the image and just pull away, like the image was made of some kind of flexible plastic or something. That's the basic idea with the shader. You take a pixel, figure out how far away it is from the origin or from the middle of the image, kind of move that pixel out, and then look back at where your pixel originally was and use that color instead. So I'm just going to use norm here to get the coordinates of the pixel and then subtract 0.5 to figure out how far away that pixel is from the origin. Subtracting 0.5 here actually subtracts 0.5 from x and from y, so we're finding the center relative to in, on, along both of those axes. And then I'm just gonna divide by a factor called zoom. And I'm dividing by rather than multiplying, which is maybe what you would at first guess that we would do. When I talked about pulling your finger away and then looking back at where you started, that the looking back to where you started is where the division comes into play, if that makes sense, because where you're actually drawing the pixel color from is sort of not as far away as where the, the image got stretched to. I don't know if that explanation made sense. Um, to be honest, I messed this up and used multiplication the first time. But if you, wanna, if you want to think about it this way, where bigger zoom values mean stretch the image out more, then you want to divide by zoom rather than multiply. Do param zoom one at min 0 0.001, just so that we never divide by zero, which would, I don't know, be bad somehow. It's probably not even that bad. It probably just doesn't do anything interesting. So we'll do sample here. Sample takes the image to sample on the left and the coordinates to sample width in the right. And that's it, there's our zoom shader. So now if I take this, and I put this between the fade and this guy. It doesn't necessarily really matter where if it goes between or after, but that should be all we need now if we want to. I'm just going to make some space here. So there's our fade, and I'll also make a zoom. Um, and of course, the zoom goes between, say, zero or one and two. So now if I attach this, we can zoom out. Yeah, that's the stupid effect that I wanted. Well, I call it stupid. It looks it looks kind of cool if you're Yeah, it's cooler than I it's cooler than I like to admit. Um, maybe it bothers me sometimes when really simple things uh, end up having a cool ah, it's cool if the if one of the colors is dark, I kinda like it. That's oh that's nice. I can get behind that. 
Damn. Okay. Hmm. Maybe it is ready for the club after all. Uh, so the kind of last thing that I want to do is I'd like to uh, kind of take this. I, I kind of want to get these. I have an idea for kind of getting waves to come off this thing where, you know, you basically draw down a nice light image of this shape sitting on top of this background and then stretch it out. But then you make the image, you no longer kind of uh, draw this distorted sphere that we've made. So you draw it once, but then you stop drawing it. And then as it kind of stretches out, you just see this ring. Like right now you see lines coming off this thing, but I have this this thing in my head of sort of seeing rings coming off of it instead. So kind of the way that I'm going to go about that is I want to kind of take this fade that we're applying at each stage of this and use that to kind of crossfade or or turn off this image basically before it goes into this effect. So you can sort of imagine if I take this fade control here and connect it up like this, that if this image, if this fade is turned down, then let me make the shape bright again really quick. So here's my nice bright white shape. If I turn this fade down, the image fades to black or the shape fades to black rather. And then you can see that it never, it never draws anymore. So you can almost kind of see if I move this up and down really quick, the sort of rings that eh, you can see it. You can see the rings sort of that I'm talking about coming off this shape. Uh, so what I want to do though at the end, of course, is mix back in. So this is sort of controlling how much of the image goes into the effect, but then I still want to have the original shape sticking around. So I'm going to add another alpha blend here, and this is blending together the original shape with some amount of effect mixed in. Right, so now if I connect this in, there you can see the original shape sitting on top of this background. But now if I crank this fade up and down, so can you see, what, you see what I'm talking about? You see these kind of rings coming off of this image that nonetheless remains drawn even though I'm uh, moving this thing around. So that's actually kind of all I wanted to do from a, an effect standpoint. But the cool thing now is to take these things and each one of these is ripe for some kind of audio manipulation. And I'm not talking about um, neuro-linguistic programming. I'm talking about, if I'm, if I'm reaching for a sample, you know there's only one sample I'm ever, you don't even have to ask. It's gonna be prim.loop. Prim.loop is the only audio I need. And I'm gonna throw an easy DIC so we can all enjoy it together. And then some basic envelope extraction stuff. So ramp smooth one 5,000 and then throw that into a abs tilde, take the absolute value, that goes into a snapshot to downsample to control rate. And then because we've got a jit.world and it's already sending out bangs, we can paste in an R bang here to sample this snapshot once per frame. So we're not sampling, we're sampling with the frames and those are all nice and lined up. And if I turn audio on, there you can see the nice values coming out. And then it's just a question of taking this and you could map this to anything, map it to this fade. So that's kind of what I was hoping to get, right? Is you uh, can't hear myself over this sick beat. Um, the, the sound kind of plays and whenever it's loud, it makes this nice ring happen. And you can play with these other factors and make stuff happen. Well, that's even kind of neat. It's probably better if there was some way to wait, hold on. Let me throw in a metronome. So we get new noise once in a while. Oh yeah, that's what's up. And then you could probably map this to the noise amount as well. And then we probably have to scale this in a particular way to make it work, but I bet you could map this to the zoom as well and have it be cool. All right, I appreciate that watching me turn knobs at the end of these videos might be entertaining. I wonder how long it can be entertaining, um, but bear with me. So let's do something like R slider at size one at float output one. Is this loop getting annoying to you yet? This is, this is what I do. I make these patches, I leave this loop on, 
It plays over and over in my head. And now when I close my eyes before I fall asleep every night, I hear this loop playing. Um, so our slider and then make a scale object. Uh, zero, one, zero, one. I don't know what the scale is gonna be. Probably two at classic zero. And then this will let me low output value. Yes, like this. So let me see if I can make this work the way I want to. Not like that. Oh Jesus, I've ruined everything. And that's way too much. Maybe like this. Uh, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. That, that's what I wanted. Wait, come back. I had it. Yeah, there you go. That's exactly the effect I was trying to get. I really like that where the amount that it zooms is proportional to the amplitude. I always feel like it looks like the sound is kind of pushing it out, you know? And if I had the colors automated at the same time, I bet it would be really exciting. Maybe like this. Yeah. Anyway, I gotta go. I gotta, I gotta, I don't know about you guys, but all of a sudden I have to get me some of that primitive action. Um, but in any case, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'll probably clean this up and then put it up there with some nice presets on it. Uh, in any case, thanks for watching. I'm excited with where this one's going. I think it's gonna get, in the end, it's gonna get to a really fun place. And yeah, I'll see you guys in one pretty soon for some more gen, hopefully. But until then, take care, take it easy, and I'll see you in the next one.